Hello and welcome back to the channel and welcome to the inside of the AC Cars production facility on the south coast of England. There's a reason it's here and I'll come to that in a moment. This is the all new, all singing, all dancing AC Cobra GT Roadster. AC has been making cars basically for 120 years. He's been making Aces and then Cobras and then classic Cobras for a long time. But a lot of other people make Cobra-ish looking cars and it thinks, you know what we need to do is make a proper, proper new Cobra model this car is it. AC Cars was originally founded in 1901, but it's in the 1950s where things get interesting for Cobras. AC introduced a car called the Ace in 1953, but by the early 60s Bristol, which made its engines, retired its inline six and a European Ford replacement was disappointing. Texan racer Carol Shelby provided the answer with a big Detroit Ford V8 and the Cobra was born. It's extremely exciting to drive, Autocar said in 1965, the same year that racing Cobras were beating Ferrari to the FAA GT Championship wearing a sleek coupe body. Up to 1967, 1,002 Cobras were made, partly in the UK, partly in the US, and this is where it starts to get complicated. In 1982, British Cobra specialist Autocraft got permission from AC to restart Cobra production with the Mark IV. In 1986, AC itself was going under after trying, unsuccessfully, to launch the very pretty 3000 ME Coupe, so sold up to Autocraft and Ford lent it the right to use the Cobra name. But not long after, Shelby restarted Cobra production in the US too, leading to a public war of words. All original Cobras were made in the UK, said AC's owner, Brian Anglis. AC was never anything but a subcontractor to Shelby American, said Carol Shelby. People want cars by Carol Shelby, he said, and don't give a hoot about anything produced by Brian Anglis as far as original Cobras are concerned. In the 1990s, AC got another new owner and things have become a little less tense since, with both Shelby and AC making traditional looking Cobras. Which brings us to today. The full story of all of this, by the way, is available in the Autocar archive, which you can find at themagazineshop.com forward slash autocar. And thanks to Autocar's unique 129 year history, it's all there and it's all brilliant. Anyway, now AC is going to stop making traditional looking Cobras and do two things. One is to relaunch a traditional looking Ace model. Its Cobra lineup will be this all new car. So let me tell you some of the production details of it. There is a largely extruded aluminium chassis, which is quite stiff. And on top of that is, and this is one of the reasons why being on the South Coast is an advantage, there is a carbon fiber body and there's a lot of good carbon fiber companies around here. It's bigger than an old Cobra. You can, you can see that it's 4.3 meters long. It's nearly two meters wide. It looks like a Cobra, doesn't it? But it's obviously not a classic one. There is an engine about here. It's all behind the front axle line. It's a Ford 5 litre V8. You can have one with a supercharger. This one has one. It can make up to 666 horsepower, 670 horsepower, which is quite a lot. It's been detuned here for reasons I'll come on to in a moment. Double wishbone front suspension with push rods. This edition runs 21 inch alloys, but there is uh, an unsupercharged car. We'll get 19 inch alloys. It drives through a six speed manual or a 10 speed automatic gearbox. To the rear where there's a limited slip differential, be a standard friction differential, a standard or torsion diff if you uh, up-spec the supercharged one. Double wishbone suspension at the rear as well. All up, the weight is around 1400 kilograms. So it will be very light, very fast. It has two seats. Seriously, have a look inside. This is the experimental prototype number one. So we're quite lucky to be given a go in it today because it's the only one there is. It's in the UK and the weather is dismal outside, which is why we're filming this in here. We'll go out on the road in a minute. But I've been in full production spec cars that do not look, especially sort of limited volume cars that do not look as good as this in finished form. And this is the first prototype. So we're very fortunate to be given a go. Uh, as soon as it stops drizzling, we'll go out on the road and tell you what it's like. Okay, so this is the inside of the new Cobra. The windscreen of this pre-production car is a prototype in polycarbonate and the camera is attached to it. So if there is a little shaky cam, apologies, but that's the reason why. The finished thing will, of course, be glass. The rain has abated long enough for us to have a go, but it has no traction control at the moment, no ABS at the moment. The brakes are not servo assisted at the moment. The steering is 
only ever on its maximum assistance. It will have a sort of speed variable level of assistance, so it waits up as you go faster. But at the moment, it doesn't have any of that, and it has no anti-roll bars. So, it is not finished. But they're like, well, we'd like you to see what it's like, and I'd like to see what it's like, and I'd like to tell you what it's like. So, here we go. One, it makes the right noises for a start. Don't know how well you can hear them with the wind. The windows are not going up at the moment either, and they're polycarbonate, as is the windscreen. That will all be glass. Sounds really good. There's a lovely throttle response. Uh, the pedal spacing is excellent. I'm sitting pretty straightish. I've got loads of room to the passenger. What I don't have for a wide car is much room on this side of me. This is a Mustang steering wheel. It's not my favorite steering wheel. Actually, it's quite thick rimmed, not entirely round. Forgive quite a lot, can't you? Um, but it does mean that I, there is a bit sort of old Land Rover Defender door issue. Uh, it is quite close. I think you'd probably come to live with it, to be honest with you. Visibility is good. I love the view across the bonnet. I can see the scoop, see the bonnet, see the, see the arches. And then I've got this amazing view in the mirror as well of the rear haunch. Throttle response is fantastic gear shift is fantastic as well I think it's maybe it's running the kind of short shifter type thing because it's really slick it's really accurate it's in, it's like it's running through a metal gate you know it's got that kind of feel but it also you get a certain amount in and it just slots the gear home it really wants to change god it's really nice I really like this interior treatment you got the analog dials all across the top. Big rev counter, big speedo, supplemented by digital speedo because it's not 100% uh, at the moment. And then like temperatures and pressures and stuff like that and a clock and a fuel gauge. That's all analog. I've said it before and I will say it again. I think it analog dials may become the mark of something really premium because everything has got digital dials. Something about a really finely crafted analog dial analog instrument that's really nice it will get servo assistance they think on the brake pedal but I really like it at the moment it's really really firm got a lot of time for it you can lean right up against it makes it really good for easy heel and towing I mean it's got loads of poke and it's a very slippery day and this is the only one they've got and uh, it's going back to Germany next week for some more development stuff I mean, it does say XP01 on the side for the reason it is the first prototype so I am not going to take the mickey with it basically I am going to be careful it's left-hand drive which always makes cars feel a little wider in the UK because you don't quite know where they end and this is a small British road. Cars at nearly two metres wide can feel a bit big in England. Throughout most of the rest of the world, it won't be a big deal, but this is now a reasonably large car for small British lanes. There is still suspension development work to do as well. The fact that there's no roll bars and the fact the steering is really light mean that it does feel a little bit darty like a like slightly nervously darty especially because it's left-hand drive and it's wide and the left-hand drive bit puts you in the gutter so you're also moving around a bit but there is enough here to tell me that the basics are good it's it, in terms of its ride quality it's just about right they want it to be a gt car they don't want it to be a, an all-out sports car but you could spec you could up spec the suspension for something more racy if you want i'm not sure i would I think this has a really nice balance at the moment of ride compliance and body control. I mean, this is only a 1400 kilo car, so it's not like it needs really stiff dampers to give it good body control. And the ride is good. I mean, it's on 21 inch alloys. 
but the ride is really nice. It's running for Pilot Sport 4S tyres at the moment, Michelin's. You could get a cup tyre, but that might be a bit racy. You may not need it. The price is from sort of a quarter of a million quid plus your local taxes, which is a lot of money, but it is a bespoke car. It feels beautifully finished so far inside. Given this is the only the first one, a production one should feel really nice. It's not the sort of car that cares about 0 to 60s and top speed and lateral Gs. It just makes you feel good about driving it. To my eyes, it looks great. Whether you think it's over caricatured or not, it's entirely up to you, but I love the look of it. I love the feel of driving it. I love lots of things about it. More to come, basically, when they finished it. Production and customer deliveries are their priority. So we'll hopefully have another go at some point in a finished one in future. But for now, it's really promising. So thank you for joining me. We're here every week. You can also find us at autocar.co.uk where you can find a full review of this with all of the technical details as well. Cheers for joining me. I'll see you next time.